this is a, a celebration, a showcase. We've called it the Low Carbon Devon Showcase. Most of the team now have been here for about two years. So we wanted to bring some people together to share some stories and showcase what we've been up to, but also take stock and explore what's next in terms of low carbon or, or net zero support in the region and have a conversation, have some ideas floating around, build the momentum or we'll keep that momentum going and see what we can do moving forwards. Um, but let's just be open, bring an open mind and get to know people as well. I encourage you in the break to, to ask curious questions um, and see if you can some, meet some new people and, and try and build something together. So it's a really collaborative effort, um, today's event. Uh, we also have lots of people that are helping out facilitating and our Low Carbon Devon Steering Group as well. So thank you for coming um, as well and making this event a really, really collaborative effort. So thank you. But I think I'll hand over to um, Michael, who is going to be our first speaker. And we, then after that, we've got Megan and Martin. So Michael, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Mike, look oh, perfect. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, I was asked to give kind of the, the one of the motivational speeches. Why are we actually talking about uh, uh, net zero? And I'll helicopter in from a nurse system perspective uh, and uh, uh, also try to give a little bit of a motivation that we all need to brace for some more uh, emergency, but also uh, for what I call in the end uh, regulatory uncertainty. And uh, those who do and run businesses, uh, this is a big question for investment where you go. Um, but uh, basically what, what it is about is, uh, is transitioning to kind of a, a much brighter and greener future and uh, the question how we are, we are going to do that. And uh, uh, when I started my career, uh, the safe climate was defined uh, in at the beginning of the 90s uh, all the way to 2010 or so in terms of uh, 450 ppmv in the atmosphere. This is about 3.5 degrees of warming, which currently we consider absolutely catastrophic. We really don't want to go there. But uh, at that time, and this is only 20, 30 years ago, we thought this is, this is the goal we need to go for. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we wised up and, uh, and said two degrees, which is also not really so interesting anymore. And then at the Paris Agreement uh, in 20, what was it, 15, 16, uh, uh, we defined 1.5. Mm -hmm. And so, so here, uh, zero net as a target uh, is almost surely not to survive. We will always become more and more ambitious, especially because we don't do anything on a global level. We don't do enough, and therefore we will have to become more, uh, more, uh, more ambitious. Um, me as an academic, I need to do definitions, so I, please bear with me. Um, so what we have is, when you look, these are the scenarios uh, that lead to 1.5 or 2 degrees. So what you see here is, you first, we're still going up, and then we have peak emissions up here, and we are still going towards the peak. We did not manage on a global level, and this was even on the radio today, we, we did not manage yet to bend the curve to actually go down. And uh, there's something called the carbon budget. Um, so this is the, the still remaining CO2 emissions which we can commit in order to do uh, 1.5 if we go to zero uh, emissions immediately afterwards. And this is only about 10 years away from us, mm. and maybe even less. Mm. And then we basically, we go to net zero. So typically people define it at, at around 2050. So this means where uh, the net emissions, the fossil fuel emissions are then basically in balance with uh, uh, the absorptive capacity of ecosystems that actually enter this accounting. And we can spend ages to define what that really is. Um, but then the, People, many people think once we are at, at net zero, we actually, we were winning, like the guys uh, in, in Paris, but that's actually not the case, because if we just uh, uh, stop here, then uh, we'll still commit to warming. We actually have to go net negative uh, quite deeply. 
And I will elaborate on that a little, little more later. Um, but before going there, um, the question is, are the current plans uh, enough in terms of uh, the global community, and is it fair? And so what, what you see here is this is the figure I showed to you uh, before from the, 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 the large models that go to 1.5. This is what business as usual is. So this is what, uh, if we don't do anything, and this is what, uh, what the, the, the countries up to now pledged. Now it's uh, in, uh, in Sharm el Sheikh, it's a little, little closer, but there's hu still a huge gap. And we are, we're still going up with the emissions. So it doesn't, doesn't look too great. And then the fairness is really an interesting uh, concept. So here I take the example of Switzerland, and Switzerland, uh, is currently aiming at 90% uh, emission reduction by 2050, but uh, research colleagues in Switzerland actually calculated the fair share emission reduction, and the fair share emission reduction today would be 120%. So 120% means you don't only stop all fossil fuel emissions, you actually start to suck out CO2 out of the atmosphere. If, and this, is, this would be the fair share, taking into account the historically uh, emissions they already uh, uh, committed to. So, so we are in a very strange world because some of these, these emissions they should give to, to India and other developing countries to still, still have uh, cheaper supplies. So when, when, when you guys say net zero, uh, it's great, but uh, surely not enough and surely not fair. Sorry. Um. <laughs> uh, another bad news, another, another bad news. So, so I, I talked to you uh, about the, the carbon budget. And uh, in the carbon budget, typically people don't really look at uh, what's happening to nature. And one thing uh, that has been in the news last year a lot uh, were these craters in Siberia, where basically uh, you have permafrost melting. And what, uh, what some of our colleagues did, uh, they calculated once this, the, this uh, permafrost is melting, you ha actually have methane and CO2 uh, emitted into the atmosphere, which typically we did not account for when we go uh, for the 1.5 degree scenarios. Mm -hmm. And then we calculated if we actually take this Earth system uh, feedback into account, these additional emissions we were not planning for, uh, we actually found that uh, uh, we have a 5% probability that the carbon budget is already gone today. So this means that the world should actually shut down all CO2 emissions immediately and start sucking uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere. And I always say, if you are run down by a car with a 5% probability out on the streets, you de definitely don't go out. Uh, but with the Earth system, since this is so far away, we are actually don't really care. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's a quite strange situation to be in. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and this is, uh, we do this ourselves and it's a lot of fun, so um, uh, I always need to talk about this. So what, what we did then is um, uh, we defined the new uh, climate targets uh, and we said we want to have the same amount of permafrost uh, in 2,500 as we have today. And then we switch on a model and calculate what would be the emission pathway to bring us there. And what we find is that, uh, so this is, this is about 2100. So before 2100, we go very, very negative. But then we actually, for 400 years, we actually go net negative. And in some, in some cases, we even have to refreeze the earth and the, the permafrost in actually, in order to make the same in 2500 what we have today. So here, all what I want to say is, this issue will stay with us for a very, very long time. And the faster we start to solve it, uh, the, the better it is. Um, especially for our uh, grandchildren. I became a grandfather already, so I'm, I do care about uh, this generation here in 2100, already today. So I will not make it, most likely. Um, another bad news, I'm the bad news guy. Um, so, so what, uh, what's really interesting is, is in terms of uh, economic instruments is when you, have, when you want to regulate CO2 emissions, you either put the tax or you do emission trading and uh, the government collects then the proceeds from the, the, the auctions. 
And uh, as long as you have emissions, the government collects a lot of money and is happy and can redistribute and can actually engage in just transitions and all of those kind of things. However, as soon as you had hit net zero, uh, the, the, the tax is taxed on something that is negative, which means this becomes an expenditure item to the, to the government. And all what we did is we calculate in 2090, how much money would the, the governments of the world need to spend in order to finance negative, net negative emissions? And we found it's about the budget share of a healthcare system in the UK. So every government would actually have to spend this much money if the costs of negative emission technologies don't come down. And of course, if you think about fair share, those countries who committed a lot of historic emissions, they would actually have to pay more than others. So here, basically, very quickly, the, the entire government budget is gone. Um, so this is also something we need to, this is an unsolved problem. Uh, we are working on it, but uh, 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 it's a public, uh, public finance problem, which no one really thought about yet. Again, uh, the earlier we start, the less problem we have later. Um, and so what, what's for sure going to happen is that net zero definitions will change very soon. Simply two reasons, we don't do enough, therefore we have to go to net zero much, much earlier. Uh, and we have all of these, uh, these earth system feedbacks and so forth. And we might have in international negotiations, we, we, we need to, uh, to uh, contribute more. But overall, we also need to think about uh, this overshoot here. So this is the overshoot of CO2 in the atmosphere. And now we are planning for such a schedule of, uh, of emission reduction, where we go net zero in 2050, and afterwards we compensate for the sins we committed up here. Uh, but we have this overshoot, which triggers uh, some of these uh, Earth system uh, um, uh, trigger points, uh, like permafrost. So we might actually need to go into a situation where we do much more in terms of net zero much earlier, where we commit to more negative emissions uh, uh, than we anticipated otherwise. And, uh, and so, so here, uh, regulatory risk will come in uh, quite soon, I would say. So uh, just to summarize, I probably, uh, I'm over time already. So it's an absolute no brainer to go for, for killing uh, CO2 emissions from fossil fuels. Uh, I think that's, that's, uh, that's super, super clear. Uh, however, we will also have to prepare for a net negative economy. And this we need to prepare already today. And probably this has not been at the, at your radar screen uh, uh, up to now. Uh, and we will have to live with surprises, both from nature, but also from, from policies. Uh, and as a counter reaction, countries like the UK will have to kind of overcompensate for others uh, who don't. And, uh, uh, and what still needs to happen is uh, what in climate negotiation terms is called common but differentiated burden sharing. Uh, between countries on the international level. This is not worked out yet. Again, as we look at Sharm El Sheikh at the moment, uh, we are not getting there. Uh, we did not solve the, the intergenerational problems in the sense of who is going to finance the net negative economy later on uh, and how difficult it is. And plus there are also quite a lot of technological problems. And then within country, you know, what's the burden sharing arrangement in, amongst you who are in the room? both as a citizen, a personal consumer, and, uh, and as a company. So uh, what I'm basically saying is if you're a company, uh, but even as a, as a consumer facing then uh, uh, reg regulation, there's huge um, uh, amount of regulatory risk ahead of us, simply because we, we, need, we will have to react to, to the news uh, in the future. And, uh, and what's interesting is, and this is something I, I do for, uh, for, for some other uh, science uh, in terms of uh, investment calculus, the uncertainty is so huge. And when the uncertainty of kind of future reg regulation is, is uncertain, the best strategy is you actually wait. And that's ex exactly what we shouldn't do. Um, so, so here, working with uh, uh, 
better signals from policy and regulation would be a great blessing. However, there are inbuilt, uh, 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 um, how shall I say, there are, it doesn't make sense for, for policymakers to be too prescriptive because otherwise you cannot negotiate somewhere else. <laughs> and so, so here, this is an inbuilt problem and uh, only very forward-looking citizens and businesses can actually really solve this problem. And with this, probably should stop now. Thank you. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, so Michael's joined us from, from Oxford as the Environmental uh, Change Institute Director. So do you think of some questions? Hopefully he's presented some, some thought-provoking thought -provoking things for you to think about. So next up, we're gonna flow straight in to our next speaker, uh, which is Megan, uh, Megan Pierce from the Met Office, who is a scientific consultant. So over to you, Megan. <laughs> Thanks everyone uh, for having me today. It's nice to be back at the university. Uh, I was a student here um, not so long ago, but longer than I would like. So it's nice to be back to speak to you all today. Um, thanks Michael for sort of setting that global context. I'm gonna be talking about uh, the UK landscape of net zero. So similar to what Michael was just presenting, this is the, sorry. <laughs> No problem. Uh, this is the climate action tracker thermometer. So this shows us what will happen to global mean temperature at the end of the century based on current action and policies. And this ranges from real world action now, even to the most optimistic scenario where if we implemented all of the nationally determined contributions, pledges and targets out there, we're still falling short of this 1.5 degrees Celsius warming of the Paris Agreement. So plenty of work still to be done. So what are the UK targets? So in 2019, we legislated that we would be net zero by 2050. In the UK's net zero strategy, they set out a number of other targets to help us get there, including fully decarbonizing our power system by 2035, um, a target of 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, and the banning of petrol and diesel car, new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. So the question is, is how are we doing so far? Unfortunately, not particularly well. So the Climate Change Committee, who are an independent body responsible for advising and providing the government evidence on all things climate, have done an assessment of our progress. The most latest assessment was in October 2022, this just this year. And unfortunately, they found out that only 39% of the required emission savings are covered by credible plans. These credible plans mostly relate to our electricity supply and transport. So for example, we're making steady progress towards that offshore wind capacity and the uptake of electric vehicles is on pathway for government ambitions. However, there are still significant risks in most other sectors. So we need to make improvements, for example, in our low carbon heating, our aviation demand, our energy efficiency, and things like woodland creation and peatland restoration. The government have also been mandated by the courts that they need to assess the impact of their current policies on emission reductions and they need to provide this evidence by April 2023. So where do our greenhouse gas emissions come from in the UK? The top four contributors in 2019 were households, energy, manufacturing and transport. I've chosen 2019 to provide that pre-COVID context. Although when you look at the 2020 data, um, although the overall UK emissions were lower, these are still the top four highest contributors and households are still contributing 26% to the UK emissions. These four also use the most energy from fossil fuels. So a real area to target for our net zero ambitions. This poses an interesting question though, what is the responsibility of the public and households to reduce their contributions? And I think this is quite interesting. For example, the Climate Change Committee have said that we need to reduce our meat consumption by 35% by 2050 for net zero ambitions. But actually in the UK, our meat consumption is already declining and that's without any mandates from the government. So this is an interesting example of societal response. However, we face, we face barriers, right, as the public and as consumers in what we can do in our actions. We are all acutely aware of the cost of living at the moment where 
we are limited in perhaps on how we want to spend our money, for example, in terms of using a renewable energy tariff. This plot on the right is showing how the cost of travel has changed in recent years. And as you can see, more sustainable um, routes of transport, such as getting the bus or traveling by rail, are more expensive and are increasing. So this is a limit to us in terms of reducing our contributions. So then how about the role of business? One of the reasons we're all here today. In the UK government strategy, they have said that they want to make the act of choosing green significantly easier, clearer and cleaner. And they want to work closely with partners like local authorities, voluntary organisations, businesses, many of you in the room today. They recognise the role in terms of how we use and choose different services. Along the bottom, I've just pulled out some of the key principles they've set out in terms of what is the role of people and business in the net zero strategy particularly around empowering people and businesses to make their own choices. So what support and initiatives exist to help along this journey? I've just put some examples here. So for example, we have the Goal 13 Impact Platform. This is a tool which collates cross-sector learning on targets, drivers, barriers, and impactful initiatives to encourage cross-sector learning. Some of you might be familiar with the SME Climate Hub, a curated tool of resources and support specifically addressing the obstacles and barriers that SMEs face in targeting net zero. And we have things like the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment that provides us with regional and sector based assessments on risk opportunities and identifying where further action is needed. But what do these initiatives try to help us with? It's all about building climate resilience. And this is twofold. We have mitigation. This is the action we take to reduce the emissions. And that could be reducing our dependency or consumption of fossil fuels or the engineered removal of emissions from the atmosphere. Then we have adaptation. We only need to look at this year's unprecedented extreme weather across the globe to know that we're already feeling the impacts of climate change. Adaptation is about how we manage these risks and impacts. We already need it now and we need it urgently. However, there's lots of mutual benefits to mitigation, adaptation and building climate resilience. It can help us move towards other sustainable development goals, such as water quality and availability, improved biodiversity, improved health and well-being and better education for all. Hopefully you're familiar with some of these examples of local support here in Devon that can help you on your journey to building climate resilience. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from some of the businesses today about your journey. From a Met Office perspective, we help in terms of building climate resilience with our work, both internationally and locally through our science and services. On the UK, this is just an example of our UK Climate Resilience Programme. This is everything from characterising and quantifying hazards such as extreme weather, thinking about adaptations such as building resilient food systems and our services, all about bringing the science to the people who need it. So I want to kind of leave us though on a positive message. What kind of world do we want to live in? What do we want for our future generations? Well, this plot is showing us what future temperature change will look like under different scenarios. But look to 2050, look to 2100. The scenario is still to be decided and our future is still to be decided. And we all, governments, businesses and people have a role to play, a contribution to make, a contribution to reduce in deciding what that scenario will be. And I'd like to finish with these four key lessons from the Goal 13 Impact Platform Voices of Report, which I think nicely summarise about how do we get there? How do we make more action? Number one is about foundational capabilities. This is about innovation, new engineering, new science, building this into everyday life, building that climate resilience. Number two, building momentum. Chris mentioned this in his introduction. I don't know about anyone else, but I feel there's been a real change in recent years. There's a renewed urgency for climate action. Let's run away with that. Let's landslide with that. That's what we need. We need action and we need it quickly. Number three, collaborating. 
This is my favorite thing. And one of the things we're all doing here today. At the moment, climate action often happens in silos. We're doing science, business is making decisions, engineers are designing new buildings, but it can't happen in silos. We all need to come together and it's our collective skills, our diverse skill sets and experience that are the answer. And that brings us on to number four, communication. We have to talk just like we're doing here today. We need to exchange knowledge, share ideas, break down barriers. By communicating and collaborating, that will be the key as the UK to help deliver on these net zero ambitions. And as Michael suggested, moving beyond net zero and thinking about net negative in the future. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you. Great, thanks, Megan. Again, do you think of some questions and we'll, we'll come to those shortly. Uh, but next up, we've got uh, Martin Hunt from Forum for the Future. So I'll hand over to you, Martin. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Devon. Hello, hello. Good. We're just checking you're still awake. Um, just, I know it's probably been a long week for someone. It's been a long week for me. I'm actually, you might see I'm hobbling a bit. That was an overzealous footballing accident on Tuesday, but I'm here. That's the main thing. Okay, good morning. So um, just a bit about Forum for the Future. I'm really going to talk a little bit about the business landscape as we see it. Forum for the Future, we're, uh, we've been going about 25 years. We're an international non-profit organization. Uh, although we started off just here in the UK, um, we've now got international offices. We do a lot of work with business, um, large businesses primarily, although some small businesses from uh, time to time, really talking about uh, sustainability. We talk a lot about the transformation that is needed, for example, in terms of our economy and the business landscape in terms of mindsets, models, practices within business. But we also work with other organizations outside of the, the business sector as well. Okay, and I guess the critical thing is we talk a lot about systems thinking and thinking about things in terms of holistic solutions. And hopefully that will come through during the course of my presentation. So uh, as Michael alluded to in his, his presentation, uh, regulatory risk is gonna be a bit, bit of a challenge. And I think what fundamentally, this, where we are today at the moment in terms of both the climate agenda, but actually the business landscape more broadly, we're, we're really in a situation where a relatively stable operating context has now gone. We are in a period of discontinuity. We're in a situation where actually continuing business as usual or incremental change is not gonna be enough to, to address the challenges and be resilient to the challenges we're actually now facing. Climate change being obviously a significant element of, of our operating context at the moment. But it is not just simply a question of carbon. It's simply not just a question of climate change. One thing that we talk about a lot in terms of our work is understanding that climate change is actually not happening, it's not taking place in isolation. And many of the big challenges we actually face, whether that be ecosystem collapse, whether that be livelihoods and social justice, um, structural inequalities, health and well-being, and so on. You know, climate change is being influenced or indeed accelerated. A lot of these things are being influenced or accelerated by climate change, okay? So carbon metrics, the science that, you know, uh, that Michael's talked about and what we mean by net zero, Megan's outlined that, very, very critical. But one thing we would be advocating business to be thinking about is understanding the interplay between other things that are actually taking place today. And we would say that's actually an opportunity to address interconnected issues. So Megan's talked about a siloed approach in terms of occupations or different sectors. We would also argue that actually we need to be thinking beyond just thinking about carbon emissions, and narrow topic specific targets to actually thinking about much more interconnected, holistic type of solutions, okay? So for example, just on the right there, this is a project we're doing, um, it's a significant large project we're doing in, in, uh, in our, from our US office, which is really around the idea of regenerative agriculture not only trying to address um, challenges around, for example, carbon, but also around biodiversity, soil, structural inequalities and challenges in terms of agricultural supply chains, impacts upon indigenous communities and so on, 
um, and really about trying to reshape mindsets and thinking about what the agricultural system is all about and how we can actually sustain it into the long term through much more regenerative practices. So in terms of the landscape, where we're actually at the moment, just to summarize, you know, I think, you know, economic disruption caused by climate impacts, um, including within value chains, is going to continue and get worse over a period of time. And there's going to be demand for transparency and action across a greater range of issues as a consequence um, of, for example, a much more enlightened, for example, consumer base and citizen base and communities, but also regulatory changes and policy landscape is going to change. And there's going to be demand for greater transparency and action. Already, we're starting to see consumers rewarding those purpose-driven brands that are really integrating sustainability, justice, regenerative practices into the way they're thinking and way they're starting to act. Net zero is going to become table stakes for all sectors. You can't avoid this. We're all on one planet. We're all in the same context. For some sectors, it may hit harder and earlier, but it's going to be there for every organization, every business. The widening inequality that we're actually seeing, we t you know, Michael touched upon the idea of fairness and in fairness between nations, but actually within nations, you know, we've just seen the challenges around the energy crisis and how that is exposing real inequality, for example, within our society and the gaps there that need to actually be narrowed over a period of time. So the idea of a just transition, not necessarily in just of workers and communities that are wedded to high carbon industries, but us as consumers of energy, us who want to actually travel. You know, we talk about, for example, the costs associated with public transport. I was doing an event in Selby a few weeks ago where we were talking about the growth in terms of EVs, and I was on a table where they laughed. They laughed because actually, just actually being able to afford the bus trip is enough for them. So, you know, we are talking about very divergent spectrum uh, where people are actually sitting today in terms of what, for example, this drive to net zero might mean for them in terms of how they move, what they eat, where they live, and so on. But we are starting to see more and more companies make ambitious commitments and back that up with actual action as well. So we would argue, and certainly this is framed in the context of larger businesses, we would argue that corporate climate leadership is certainly about reducing and decarbonizing your operations and value chain as quickly as possible. It's about redesigning business models away from carbon intensive activities. It's about recognizing climate linkages and starting to try and seek and develop those more holistic integrated solutions. And it's not just about businesses in terms of their own operations, it's about the voice they have. It's about what are they advocating for? How transparent are they in terms of their lobbying? I think we could all point to some businesses whose business mindset seems to be predicated on the idea of delay, delay, delay. That's not really going to cut it in terms of the landscape and the challenges we face today. And in terms of the fairness that I've been talking about earlier on, that exists within supply chains. For the larger businesses to really help the smaller businesses, the small holders, if that's agriculture, or the smaller businesses in terms of their manufacturing supply chains and so on, making sure that the burden of investment doesn't necessarily fall upon those who are least able to afford it. Just, you know, there's a variety of different businesses out there. Microsoft are talking about carbon negative by 2030. Big tech company, lots and lots of money, but very, very interesting in terms of their narrative about trying to actually address historic emissions as well as current emissions. But also we're starting to see, you know, a variety of different businesses um, you know, repurposing assets, really rethinking about what they're actually doing as well in terms of their assets, their supply chains, the technologies they actually possess. Uh, well, everybody talks about the business case, you know, in, when we're talking about business. So what's the case? What's the motivation? Why should I be doing this? I'm here to make money. I think actually a lot of businesses are, you know, are thinking much more holistically and much more longer term than actually just thinking about that. And clearly, we want businesses to be prosper. Businesses are going to be a significant driver of the behaviors, the types of patterns that we actually want to be seeing in society as a whole. And we would argue that there are significant sort of like, you know, value creation 
uh, sort of like opportunities actually posed by this particular agenda. I won't go through these in detail, but you know whether that's a brand efficiency, whether that's actually about your brand and your reputation, whether it's actually in a very competitive job market space, being in a position to pull in the people that you would like to see working for your organization. And actually sort of like what's your offer or your proposition to them in terms of what you're going to be doing in terms of addressing sort of like climate change and sustainability challenges today. I would also say this is a great platform for innovation. I would argue that to a certain extent, when we see some great spurts of innovation, like for example, um, uh, we see that for example, during a, pr a period of war, unfortunate, but actually we've seen great spurts in terms of innovation and advances in terms of technology, different mindsets, different ways of thinking. Uh, my argument would be we're on a war footing now in terms of climate change. We are going to s need to see significant innovation actually emerge from businesses over the course of the next 20 or 30 years. But I would also say that there is great energy to actually address these great challenges that we're facing. Here's just a couple of examples here really about work we're actually doing. I'll just pick on a couple of them. Realizing, for example, the linkages between health and climate. We're, we're actually working with a lot of large pharmaceutical companies really trying to actually explore and leverage, for example, what they do, the practices, their, their models and their assets to actually simultaneously address both health and climate change. All the work that we're actually doing in India and Asia are really around renewable energy. What we are trying to do in terms of the massive growth of renewable energy globally is make sure that we move away from those traditional business mindsets and we just continue to do the same thing in terms of business model in a completely different industry. We want to actually be advocating and working with a, a renewable energy sector, which is actually trying to address just justice issues as well as ecological issues and trying to do that in an integrated way. But there is great appetite out there. So. Climate change will disrupt economies, businesses, and their value chains. And this emphasizes the need for resilience that Megan was talking about. It does require transformation of our models, our practices. Incrementalism is not enough. I think fundamentally it's about up here as well, mindset. But our response represents an opportunity to address some of these interconnected issues um, in terms of the wider world and our operating context. And as I said, I think it provides a platform for great leadership and innovation, reshaping and rethinking how we create and uh, measure value. Finally, in terms of what the way we actually try and frame this at Forum for the Future, we're talking about a just and regenerative approach. So recognizing these planetary boundaries that we're actually exceeding at the moment, creating and distributing value in new ways, understanding that we are all part, a fundamental part of nature, but actually also this fairness and justice issue, respecting everybody's universal rights and potential to thrive. Okay, that's it from me. Awesome, thank you. Thanks Martin and to Megan and to Michael. So what we've got a bit of time for now is some questions. Um, so I've I've got some questions, but I'd love to hear from, from you as well. So if you do have a question, uh, please do raise your hand. We've got a roving mic, and my, my colleague Johnny is going gonna, is gonna to run around with the mic. The mic's just over here, Johnny. Um, and um, try and think holistically. Try and challenge our speakers, um, and let's see what we can come up with. So I'd love to ask uh, Megan, Michael, and Martin just to come and stand at the front um so either direct your question at one of them or, or all of them and let's see see what we've got in the room so any questions hopefully i didn't just put you off by the way um we've got a question here johnny i've got one there as well from yes go for it um so to michael if, if we're struggling to communicate net zero how do we communicate Negative. <laughs> yeah. How do we communicate? How, how, yeah. So there's there's this new new bit in town, isn't it? Yeah. Talking about negative carbon. There's been a struggle to communicate about net zero carbon. This is quite a journey, isn't it? Oh yeah. So yeah, just to repeat the question. So so how do we 
So if we're struggling to communicate about climate change already, um, how do we communicate about net negative, I think is the question. Um, any thoughts or, or tips? Uh, the, the, very simple. My strategy is to talk about net negative already, that uh, decarbonization becomes a no-brainer. Hmm? <laughs> you see, but uh, 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 it's, it's a massive challenge. However, the longer we wait, the stronger the, the policy response will be. And the policy response, I actually don't see, you know, the, the, the regulatory kind of regular governmental response. What I see a lot now, and I, I work on climate stress testing for, for banks, for example, once you have these kind of more not so visible regulations coming in, uh, this will affect everyone. Mm -hmm. So that there's this kind of avalanche waiting uh, of uh, very invisible regulation that, uh, that will hit us all. And we for sure know that we will have to be way more ambitious, uh, unless we don't care about the, the climate. And we are all rats, you know, we, we, we survive anything, uh, but it will not be a very nice, nice world. Hmm? So somehow we need to get our act together. Hmm? And we have the technological means, mostly. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Gareth. Um, can I just ask a follow-up question to that, then, to, to you three, uh, before we go to the, the other question? Um, you talked about that being bold and ambitious and that uncertainty. So for me, it's like, how can we embrace that uncertainty? So I just wondered what, what mo I mean, you mentioned your, you've just become a grand grandfather, uh, but maybe Martin and Megan, sort of what, what motivates you? I'm not a grandfather, so <laughs> not motivate me. <laughs> um, what motivates me? I think, I don't think I've always cared about the environment. So I think if you are someone who cares, you don't need motivating because it's instinctive, right? If you care about the environment, the environment's at risk, we're going to do something. How do you motivate someone who doesn't care? about climate change or who doesn't necessarily agree with climate science. And I think that's where you have to bring back to these, these mutual benefits. You don't have to care about climate resilience, but do you care about your drinking water? Do you care about your access to food? Do you want future generations? Do you want your children to have good education? Do you want them to have good opportunities and you know inequality? Like that's, that's what we can motivate people with. That's the story that and the narrative that we can persuade people that this action is worthwhile. When you're thinking about some businesses, sometimes it's about money. <laughs> it's, you know, a lot that, yes, you were saying, there are actually a lot of opportunities. There's opportunities for innovation and there are some win-wins that we can make. You can save money. Um, so at the very, very minimum, if an organization doesn't care at all about the climate, the environment, there's, there's money to be saved and there's money to be made. So you have to just find what motivates each individual or each organization, which might be different. That's a really big question. Okay, and uh, I won't go on for too long, but I mean, in terms of personal motivation, I've worked in the sustainability area for too long, to a certain extent. Um, and sometimes I wake up and I listen to the day program and I just slump and I don't want to get out of bed because the news is pretty dire. And then I get out of bed and I go to work and I work with like-minded individuals, all motivated, all, all wanting and wishing for a radical change. We work with businesses or a particular organization that just floats my boat in terms of, wow, okay, they get it and they're really moving forward. And so I have my good days and bad days, I think, from a personal perspective. But also, I would say that actually there is a sea change there, not just in terms of the narrative about what people are talking about. We wouldn't have had this conversation even 10 years ago about net negative, or even though it was in academic circles, it was still it was certainly surfacing then. But you're starting to see a sea change in, for example, the markets and where finance is going. And to a certain extent, I don't want to get too political, but politicians are behind the times in terms of this. And when there are certain narratives around certain types of solutions being put forward around where we should be investing our time and energy in terms of, for example, our energy system, you recognize that they are so far behind where actually industry is, the majority of industry is, and where businesses are, and where civil society is at the moment. So I remain optimistic. I do think the idea of 1.5 is such a challenge now. But actually, even if we were to retain 
keeping with under two, I think that would still be a win considering where we are today. Um, although that would still bring significant challenges in terms of our operating context. Got a question there? Um, hello. I, my question is actually similar to the other person's question. Um, and it's to do with this net, net negative situation. And I've been in a lot of uh, several talks by climate scientists and they're utterly terrifying. But the, the, that message doesn't get out to the general public it's talking about being behind and it's because they chase public opinion and public opinion is um, swayed by what they're told by the media and the media aren't telling the story with enough urgency or facts. And um, how do we, I mean, are there people from the media here in this room, there's never seems to be journalists in these events hearing this kind of talk. Um, so how do we get the media to the politicians will act and yeah yeah great question so for those of you who might not have heard that so it's about um how do we engage again around engagement how do we engage with those people not already engaged and maybe how can we use the the media to to share that positive story of, of change um we are going to hear a talk later after the break um which which might cover that um, so stay tuned. But any any thoughts from from the three of you? Again, this is a personal reflection from me. But you know, actually, in terms of maybe the political sort of like side of things, unfortunately, net negative means an admission of failure. Nobody's really comfortable with the idea of failure. And recognizing, although we had the science, we've had the picture in front of us for decades we have failed to actually address it to such an extent where mitigation alone will do it. The idea of overshoot and having to take billions of tons of CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions out of the atmosphere um, is something that, you know, it's really hard to grasp. And actually in terms of where that technology is around that, there are technologies emerging, but there's still an innovation gap. And also the investment required to subsidize and support that is just phenomenal. This is that four footing type of thing I was talking about. That's a personal perspective. I wouldn't necessarily say everybody within my organization holds that view, but I certainly, are, I'm coming to terms with that at the moment. I think it's a really good question about the media um, and about the role that the media play. I think the one thing to bear in mind is never underestimate the value of your own voice. You have to think about how media spreads, okay? The way that we share articles, the way that we engage with media as individuals, that's how news stories blow up. We have a role to play in that. I know a lot of really good climate journalists who really are doing their best to do evidence-based news reporting, but it's only when people engage with it that that message then spreads far and wide, right? So we have a role to play, but also we are all capable of speaking up. You know, we can all communicate. You know, do you know, do you know some science? Do you know, you know, what are you working on? What, what are you doing? What climate action are you taking? The more people that you speak to, the more that you share that knowledge and that evidence, the wider the message spreads, right? We have a really short time frame, right? That was the big message from the most recent IPCC report. We have a short time frame to do something. If we wait for, you know, the big organizations or policies, we know those things take time. The whole political system is set up on this cycle where it takes time for policies to come through, which frankly is time we, we don't have. So we all need to take a little bit of initiative and a little bit of critical thinking you know, spread the evidence yourself, work with those who are doing it. And I think this comes back to the contributions and the roles that we all have to play, of which policy and media is big, but we can influence that. We as individuals and we as organizations as well. Um, for me, uh, the biggest problem of solving the, the, the climate problem, but it's the same for, for biodiversity and others, um, 
no one really owns the problem. There's no element of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So that there is uh, this country or you individually, you're not responsible to clean up the mess afterwards, you know, to do the net negative uh, uh, emissions. And as long as we don't have that, uh, it's also very difficult to, to, to sell, uh, you know, these more, more, more complicated and, uh, and not nice, uh, nice stories. And uh, at least for myself, uh, that's, that's where I focus on at the moment. Uh, and we, we are currently, just to be very concrete, we're talking to central banks who actually uh, can administer what we call a carbon removal obligation, which is uh, nothing else than a, a debt instrument that would actually solve this kind of problem to introduce responsibility. Because in the end, uh, if, you, if you stand here today and you say UK uh, net zero by 2050, very, very good. But if you say uh, UK in 2080, and uh, you say, how, how much do I have to do, go, do I go net negative? And it's probably 200% compared to current emissions. Uh, then someone needs to take responsibility. And this responsibility actually needs to be transferred over. And as long as we don't have this transfer, and it's not even part of the international negotiations, there will be very little done. And so we, we need to actually get laws into place that we collectively actually take over responsibility. And as long as this is not the case, media will also not be interested because currently it's more about brand management of companies rather than taking over responsibility to really act. And as long as we just need to say, well, you know, I take, I take my share, but compute, if I compute my own debt, I'm in big trouble. I was traveling a lot, and uh, I'm currently also not really making up for it because I don't uh, believe the, 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 most of the, the offsets. So I'm also not buying offsets, but something I should do and probably uh, stop being a, a, an academic and get into, into a company that does ne negative uh, emission technologies, which I partly do. <laughs> cool, thank you for sharing. Uh, we're going to move into the, the next phase uh, of the event. But before I do that, um, I just wanted to finish by by asking our three speakers if they could just share, if you were to pick three words to describe your positive vision of the world in 100 years' time, what would those three, uh, three words be? So I'll come to you first, Martin. <laughs> Bloody hell. You didn't prime me at all around this as well. I mean, I've, you know, I think, yes, yeah, <laughs> just and regenerative. You got to go first, so you get to take the good ones. <laughs> they have to be different. <laughs> oh, should have asked. I wanted just. Um, okay, I'll say fair. <laughs> uh, collaborative um, and collective, because I think they're slightly, slightly different things. Uh, I'm from continental Europe, uh, and I like regulation <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and responsibility. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I totally chime with that sense of collective and shared responsibility. Um, so thanks very much. Um, feel free to grab a sheet, but just like to say thank you to our speakers. <laughs>